at the Long Lost Family team to help. You can apply to the programme at longlostfamily.tv. Next, the ITV News at 10. Ancestry sponsors real life stories on ITV. Racism in cricket rears its head again now in Scotland and tributes to Lord Trimble, unionist and peacemaker. Fillets that are quality, smoked salmon that's easy, tasty. Salmon is good, moi is goodness. Pain, we only talk about two sides. Pain you feel and relief once it's gone. But what about the moment in between when you start to be released from pain? When you start to get back to ordinary and ordinary feels amazing. Panadol Extra Advanced Tablets, powerful pain relief. Release starts here. The instinct to jump in and help can be overwhelming. Fight your instincts. Make the right call. Call 999. Just hang on there. Stay calm. Now, Tom Bradby has all the latest with the ITV News at 10. The images are haunting. This is Salika. Severely malnourished, she is four, but the weight of a one-year-old. This is Male, who is just one, and whom doctors thought would not survive a day when he first reached medical care. And this is Ali, who has just buried his son, the fourth child he has lost, to the terrible drought in Somalia, one of the worst in living memory. This is a historic drought, the worst in over 40 years. And the world needs to pay attention because of the sheer magnitude of needs Peter has a vivid first-hand account tonight of the scale of a crisis, which is the direct result of both climate change and conflict. Also on News at 10. 448 individual instances of institutional racism. The utterly damning report into the state of cricket in Scotland. As a person of colour, it's like out of sight, out of mind. You've gone against the institution. You spoke against people. We can't join you. Boris Johnson apparently tells supporters he regrets resigning and could look to stay as the new contenders slug it out in a head-to-head -head debate. David Trimble, a man who took enormous political risks for peace in Northern Ireland, has sadly died tonight. And preparing for sell-out crowds and the pleasure of playing at home. It is massive, um, obviously coming back to Sheffield, but more importantly we're playing in a, a home Euro semi-final against the top opposition. This is On TV News at 10 with Tom Bradby. Good evening. The countries of East Africa are no stranger to the spectre of famine. Time and again, we watch the disaster from the comfort of our Western homes, no doubt vowing to prevent it ever happening again. And then it does, and usually for the same reasons, climate change and conflict. Right now, hundreds of thousands of people in Somalia are in imminent danger of famine. Half the population face acute hunger 
Allied to the worst drought in 40 years, factors like terrorism at home and conflict in Ukraine have brought widespread food shortages and soaring prices. Huge numbers of people are gathering in displacement camps as they search for nourishment for their starving families. Often, tragically, as we'll see in Peter's first-hand account tonight, it is too late. Somalia is quite simply a country on the brink of a humanitarian catastrophe. From first light every morning, a new procession arrives in despair. Tired, starving. These people have been marching for days, traveling through a barren wilderness to get here, coming from villages hundreds of miles away because there is no food or water left. Salimo's walked for five days to get here. She hasn't eaten for two days and tells me she's no longer able to produce breast milk. To feed her baby girl, she says she adds sugar to whatever water she can find. The rains have just failed again. Almost a million people in Somalia now forced from their land. <laughs> Mohammed tells me all the cattle back home died and the wells have run dry. Some people in his group were too weak with hunger to finish the journey. They had to leave them behind. This is Kahari Camp near Dolo in western Somalia. At the start of the year, there were just 60,000 people here. Now there are 146,000. Another 500 turned up this morning. This is their last hope for help. These people are here because they are desperate and they're hungry, but there is not enough food to go around. At the moment, the number of people being driven here by the drought is rising faster than the aid can get in. There is barely enough to feed even half of those who are in need. People come here to escape death, but death is never far away. This grave is for Ali's baby boy who died last night. He stops to say a prayer. The sticks on top are to keep wild animals from digging at the body. This is the fourth child he has buried since the drought began. My son became sick. He had diarrhea and stomach pain, and then he stopped eating. The mother wonders how she will keep her remaining children alive. We don't have food or water. We don't have even the means to collect water. We don't have proper shelter. And I have nothing to cook with. It is the children who are suffering most. Almost half of those under five in Somalia are now malnourished. The most serious cases are taken to a stabilization unit. This little girl is called Salika, severely dehydrated and malnourished. She is four years old, but she's now the weight of a one-year-old. Ismail just had his first birthday. Doctors were not sure he would survive even a day when they found him, and without treatment, he would not have survived. This one ward has capacity for 16. They're now seeing more than that number in a day. Malnourishment makes children far more susceptible to diseases like pneumonia, tuberculosis and cholera. Common causes of death here, all preventable. The medical team checks for early signs of starvation. Arm measurements show green for safe, yellow for warning. This little boy is red, another child dangerously malnourished. The hospital is seeing hundreds of malnourished children every single day right now. Here, they can be treated with medication. That's enough to keep them alive. The problem is they'll then be discharged back into a country that is on the edge of a famine. Aid groups give food to the most in need, nutritionally dense supplements. For some, it'll be the first time they've eaten in days. But within months, the same children are starving again. The bigger picture that is having a stable uh, food supply for these people will be the ideal factor that will help uh, he will, help, will help them to survive. Until there's enough food, you're going to still be treating malnourished children? Definitely, absolutely, absolutely. Until we have enough supply in terms of uh, food, uh, food communities, this will be there. And the medication alone won't be enough. From above, we can see the damage done after two years without rain. Rivers are dry, homes abandoned. The crops have failed in the fields, and a third of the country's livestock has already died from starvation. The only source of food and income for millions here. The UN World Food Programme is trying to feed as many as they can with what they have. 
They're caring for more than three and a half million in Somalia now and trying to scale up urgently. What we're facing really is not just another drought. This is a historic drought, the worst in over 40 years. And the world needs to pay attention because of the sheer magnitude of needs. What we are witnessing is the beginning of a preventable tragedy. Not hidden away, but happening now in front of the eyes of the world. At the camp, we see another new arrival, a woman held up by those around her. Something is wrong. Suddenly, she collapses in front of us. The woman in front of her holds a bundle. Then all becomes apparent. The woman has given birth along the way, then somehow walked the remaining five kilometers. It is a boy. He's healthy, and his name is Abdi Najib Gulid. What life will this world offer him? Peter Smith, News at 10, Dolo in Somalia. Well, Peter and his cameraman Andy Rex were the first broadcast team to visit Somalia since the food emergency there became quite so acute. But the whole of Eastern Africa is currently overshadowed by this crisis. 89 million, yes, 89 million people are in what's called food insecurity across the region, meaning they don't have access to affordable and nutritious food. Across Ethiopia, Kenya and Somalia, it's estimated that one person dies of hunger every 48 seconds. And in Somalia alone, Alone, more than 600,000 people have been displaced in the first half of this year. More than double the number displaced in all of 2021. <coughs> excuse me, please excuse me. Now, uh, Peter joins us from Johannesburg. Peter, those are utterly haunting uh, images uh, to witness. And the statistics do tell their own story in terms of what lies behind uh, the scenes in your report. But what's unfolding, as I understand it from your reporting, is essentially a man-made disaster. Many, many man-made disasters piling on top of each other one after one. And one would be difficult enough for the Somali people, but all at once they're being hit from all angles. And this is what's pushing millions over the edge. The drought is the main driving force. I'll come back to that. But the war in Ukraine, 5,000 miles away from Somalia, is casting a long shadow. Somalia used to get 92% of its grain from Ukraine. Also, the war there is driving up food and fuel prices. Um, Somali people have been left wondering how are they going to eat. They can't import food. They can't grow food. The only option left to do is to starve. Um, the drought, though, is the main driving force. And call it what you will, the climate is changing. Yes, Somalia has had droughts before. We've reported on crises in the past. But what's happening is that droughts are more frequent, and they're lasting longer, and they're pushing more people to the brink of famine. And it's not nomadic Somali farmers who are responsible for this. It's the industrial powers who have been polluting the, the, the earth. And yet it is the poorest people who are paying the highest price, paying with their lives, their children's lives and their future. And if the world doesn't want to pay attention now, then eventually the world will have to pay attention because this crisis, as you say, millions of people now being forced from their land, that what will follow is a migration crisis when people are looking for new land because their old homes are uninhabitable. There are solutions to this. It just depends if the world is willing to commit because right now people are dying simply because they do not have enough food. OK, Peter, thank you very much indeed. Well, back here and once again tonight, the sport of cricket in Britain, with its time-honoured traditions and practices, stands accused of having racism deeply ingrained in its culture. This time, it's cricket in Scotland, where a damning report out today uncovered a shocking 448 examples of institutional racism. Yes, that's right. Almost 500. Everything from racist abuse to favouring white children from public schools. The report was commissioned after accusations brought by two players and Cricket Scotland's entire board resigned en masse yesterday. Either side of their lawyer, the two cricketers whose allegations prompted an avalanche of racism claims and the devastating review that today concluded the sport in Scotland is institutionally racist. The moment the players first spoke up about their treatment, they say their international careers ended. Are you in any doubt that you were stopped from playing international cricket because of the colour of your skin? Honestly, I can't see any other reason. I've went, I've went through it so much in my mind. As a person of colour, it's like out of sight, out of mind. You've gone against the institution. You spoke against people. We can't join you. Scotland's record-breaking bowler Majid Haq says he was humiliated in team meetings, called racist names 
and was sent home from a World Cup for tweeting always tougher when you're in the minority. It had a massive impact on me as a person, how, how I am now. It's, had a, it's, it's, it's left me really mentally exhausted, emotionally drained. When I gave so much to the team and I was a, a key player still to that time, and after the words, I was still like one of the top cricketers in Scotland. I never ever got a second chance to come back. The report covered all levels of the game and found 448 separate examples of institutional racism. It said 34% of survey respondents had personally experienced race discrimination. It also found no clear and consistent complaints process, with some people who raised issues sidelined or ignored. Cricket Scotland's entire board resigned yesterday and the report recommends the sport is placed in special measures. There has been no specific apology from Sport Scotland, the body which funds the game, while individual investigations continue. I think it's important that, that we, we work through this process and we get all of the information out clear and visible. How much more do you and need, of course, though? Well, we, we need to hear about, just as we've talked about, we need some of those individual cases, so we need to hear the detail of those. All agree there's now an opportunity to overhaul cricket, the way it is run here, and the people who run it, but expect more difficult moments before lasting change is finally achieved. Cricket Scotland has been instructed to form a new board that is diverse, and that board knows if it fails to deliver on the recommendations, it could lose some funding. Meanwhile, Sports Scotland, who will monitor how those recommendations are enforced, will no doubt be casting an eye over other sports here, just in case cricket is not an isolated case. Steve Scott, News at 10, Stirling. It is only one report, admittedly, and the petition to have him stay has only reached 10,000 out of 200,000 Tory members. But it is reported tonight that Boris Johnson has told a close ally that he regrets resigning and still could look to say stay. Blimey, you may say, perhaps even what nonsense. But at the very least, if those numbers for the petition continue to climb, it could cause his successor very significant problems. The two candidates were slugging it out head to head tonight, clashing over where they stand and what they propose to offer if they become the next Prime Minister. She's the candidate to beat. Liz Truss, arriving for tonight's debate in Stoke-on-Trent, believes she's already won the battle for hearts and minds among Tory members. But having admitted she's not the slickest performer, could Rishi Sunak, the former Chancellor, still snatch victory in the race to reach number 10? At first, he seemed on the back foot over his record, but then said he would find more money to help with energy bills. Of course there could be, and we'll have to see what the price cap actually is when we get there. As we heard, we don't know quite where it's going to be. I announced support earlier this year, which provides around £1,200 of total support for the most vulnerable. I would act immediately. I understand that people here, people around the country, are struggling with some of the worst cost-of-living problems that we've had for generations. The two contenders then clashed on her plans to borrow more in order to cut taxes. Your own economic adviser has said that that would lead to mortgage rates, interest rates going up to 7%. Can you imagine what that's going to do for everyone here and everyone watching? That's thousands of pounds on their mortgage bill. It's going to tip millions of people into misery and it's going to mean we absolutely Rishi, have no chance of winning the next election either. Rishi, I don't believe this negative, declinist... Language it's your own economic hearing. advisor, Liz. It's we, not mine. We, it's your own advisor. I have lots of economists that are backing my plans. Everybody and, and, thinks and he's that the one putting that up cited. everybody thinks that putting up taxes at this moment is going to hurt the economy. But he continued to challenge her, using it as an opportunity to point out her support for Remain in the EU referendum. Do you know what mortgage rates are in the US at the moment? Do you want to use them as an example? Their mortgage rates are almost 50% higher than mortgage rates in this country because they're borrowing so much. I'm, I'm you sorry, this Canada. is scaremongering. Ca Canada this actually is has project a, fear. This, I, I, I remember the it referendum is. campaign. I remember the referendum campaign. And there were only one of us who was on the side of Remain and Project Fear, and it was you, not me. OK. And you talk well, maybe about I've this. maybe I've learned from we're, we're, that. It wasn't all about the economy. Liz Truss was challenged to disown a tweet by one of her most prominent cabinet backers, Nadine Dorries who suggested Rishi Sunak's expensive wardrobe contrasted with her 
cheaper earrings. I didn't have any issue with how expensive anybody else's clothes are. And actually, I think Rishi is a very finely dressed person and I'm a great admirer of his dress sense. So that is not something that I would... And I don't know how she knows where I got my earrings, to be, to be perfectly frank about it. He defended his and his family's wealth and their success in making their way up in the world. I'm certainly not going to apologise for the fact that they worked hard and they aspire to do that for their kids. And in fact, as I said before, those values, those conservative values about hard work and aspiration and building a better future for your children, that's why I want to be Prime Minister. Be clear. Let me be clear that Winchester... Despite the heated exchanges, they both agreed they could work together. Whoever wins the race. Libby Vina, News at 10. Uh, and Carl was watching that debate uh, in Stoke-on-Trent. Um, Carl, I'm tempted to ask you about uh, Boris Johnson's suggestion that he quite like to stay, but we'll maybe wait until the petitions uh, to see if it gets a bit higher before we get we'll into that particular that. update. What, 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 did, what did you make uh, of what you saw tonight and how did it go down there? Well, look, I'm not sure that Rishi Sunak did enough tonight to really change the weather in this contest. And he does need to do that. Now, as far as the audience were concerned, he got a bit more applause. He got applause a couple of times. Uh, Liz Truss got applause once. But this audience were Conservative voters, not Conservative members. And it's the members who will be voting on this. And what they will have seen is Rishi Sunak come out again, very pugnacious on the economy, interrupting Liz Truss a lot. Uh, possibly too much for, well, certainly too much for her supporters, uh, possibly too much for some of the undecided, undecided. That is clearly where he still feels that he is on the strongest ground because he says that her plans would lead to more inflation. She says his plans, uh, as we know, would lead to recession. A couple of other issues we haven't heard so much about. They disagreed a bit on China, not as much as on the economy. They tended to agree on Ukraine. Where it got really quite interesting was over the personal attack that Libby just mentioned that Nadine Dorries had made on Rishi Sunak. Liz Truss did reinforce them talking about what a sharply dressed man Rishi Sunak is. Uh, briefly, on the Boris Johnson thing, look, Rishi Sunak gave him 10 out of 10 for a prime minister, which was interesting. Could he come back? I spoke to a member of the 1922 executive tonight who said, no, not this time, can't happen. OK, Carl, thank you very much indeed. Now, the death was sadly announced tonight of the Northern Ireland politician David Trimble, who made the unusual, to say the least, journey from unionist hardliner to Nobel Peace Prize winner. As one of the main architects of the Good Friday Agreement, Lord Trimble helped bring about an end to the cycle of sectarian violence that had beset Northern Ireland for decades. Labour's Sir Keir Starmer called him a towering figure. He was 77. I'm pleased to announce that the two governments and the political parties of Northern Ireland have reached agreement. After years, After years of, talks of talks and decades of... Talks. ...from this table with the union stronger than when we first sat here. Born in 1944 on an island scarred by division, David Trimble became an architect of Northern Ireland's past... It was his tough stance on the Orange Order parades in the 90s that helped secure him the leadership of the Ulster Unionist Party, but it was for his bravery in compromise for which he'll be remembered. He was prepared to stand up and go with the road of peace, go with Tony Blair and myself and the Good Friday Agreement. And, you know, that wasn't easy. He fought very hard for his community. Um, he, he was a, a tough man, a tough negotiator. I've dealt with a lot of negotiators. He was tough. Uh, he was uncompromising. But um, in the end of the day, you could make an agreement with him. And when he made an agreement, he stuck by the agreement. For his role in the negotiations that helped bring an end to the troubles, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. Northern Ireland has lost uh, a giant of a man, a man who brought so much to Northern Ireland, who helped uh, broker a peace, which is an imperfect peace, uh, but has helped Northern Ireland move on. He gave so much uh, of himself uh, to get to where we are now. Just last month, a portrait of him was unveiled in Belfast. Lord Trimble described the Good Friday Agreement as his greatest achievement. Even as Northern Ireland's politics remain polarised, that legacy lives on.
His family say he died peacefully following a short illness. Politicians from all sides acknowledging an immense debt of gratitude for all he achieved. Lord Trimble, the former unionist leader who helped bring about the Good Friday Agreement. Well, let's go and talk about uh, David Trimble with Mark, who's at Stormont in Belfast. Now, look, Mark, I guess one can say that, you know, everyone involved in that peace process, from Gerry Adams and Martin McGuinness within their community, John Hume, of course, within his, but certainly David Trimble took as many political risks as anyone, and one could argue, could one not, his party rather pe played the price of it. What do you make of his legacy? Well, Tom, let's face it, his transformation from hardline Ulster Unionist to moderate leader to Northern Ireland's first First Minister to Nobel Peace Prize winner, his, his transformation was simply remarkable. And, uh, you know, seven years after the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, it was seven years that then the, his party found himself playing uh, second fiddle to DUP. Uh, and that has really been the case ever since. The SDLP and the Ulster Unionist Party both finding themselves marginalised in the, in the recent elections. But, you know, I think history will be kind to uh, Lord Trimble when they look back at everything that he did achieve. He was criticised from within his ranks on an often occasion too. But I think ultimately it was a price worth paying when it secured peace here in Northern Ireland. OK, Mark, uh, thank you very much indeed. I know many people would certainly agree with that. Now... NHS England is mired in the worst staffing crisis in its history, according to a report today. Things are so bad, it says, that patient safety is being put at risk. The figures are, it must be said, quite startling. The report suggests NHS England is short of some 12,000 hospital doctors. Not only that, it says more than 50,000 more nurses and midwives are needed. The report also points to a survey from the Nursing Union indicating unsafe staffing levels in 83% of shifts. England's health service is condition critical. A surge in post-pandemic patients and exhausted workforce. Dr Sumi Mukherjee's practice has just half the GPs it needs. She finds it almost impossible. Senior doctors who we're training to become GPs, half of them are going off sick. What we're saying to patients is please try not to get sick at the moment. No wonder it's getting harder to see a doctor face to face. No surprise, waiting lists are a record length. This is an absence felt far beyond GPs waiting of the health and social care system. A problem now so acute, according to today's report, that it threatens patient safety. Pain for people and their families is the fact that we haven't got enough people uh, working in health and social care. There's a warning that without a major rethink, the NHS will struggle to clear the COVID backlog. Nor is the virus a spent force, adding to the pressures that lead some to quit. While the, the, the vacancies are there and the gaps are there, they're not always filled um, because, you know, we can't physically sometimes fill them. So we've had to make do with what we have. Successive governments have plugged gaps by employing staff from overseas. But that is no longer an option, says the former health secretary. The truth is there's a global shortage now of 2 million doctors, 50 million nurses, according to the World Health Organization. Everyone's got their COVID backlogs. And as we are the biggest healthcare system in the world, we just need to bite the bullet and say we are going to train as many doctors, nurses, midwives, every other frontline professional as we actually going to need. The government insists the number of healthcare staff is rising but it seems not quickly enough to satisfy demand. John Ray, News at 10. The statistics certainly are startling, to say the least. Now, finally, it's often called the home of football, and tomorrow night the city of Sheffield hosts the attempt by England to win a place in the women's Euro final. And for the player who starred in the gruelling win that got England through to their semi-final against Sweden, it's an especially important occasion. Born just a few miles away from the city, Millie Bright's first big club, was Sheffield United. One final workout ahead of one of the biggest matches of their careers. The prize up for grabs, a place in the final of Europe's most prestigious tournament. Millie Bright is coming home for the semi-final. She grew up on the outskirts of Sheffield. For you personally, how special an occasion is this? 
It is massive. Um, obviously, coming for me, that that beats anything. Um, obviously, it's it's nice to be back. I think I'm most excited. The Lionesses will be playing in front of another sellout crowd tomorrow when they face Sweden at Bramall Lane. Twenty years ago, Andy Poulsen started a girls football team for his. One player stood out, a then nine-year-old Millie, who helped them win the league in their first season, scoring 80 goals. She was an exceptional talent. You could tell straight. Exceptionally proud, the same as the rest of the country. Uh, it just makes me smile every time I hear a name or a mention. Actually amazing. It's like she's from our home. That England are playing here tomorrow. I think it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity that something so big can happen so close to us. This city, along with the nation, will be cheering the Lionesses on tomorrow, hoping this will still be ringing around the country on Sunday. Amy Lewis, News at 10, Sheffield. Right, that's all we have time for tonight. The headlines again, the, that haunting report from Somalia, the shocking report into institutional racism in Scottish cricket. It's tomorrow, but for now, good night. Thanks for watching. Tomorrow, it's a Tory leadership goggle box. Good Morning Britain's own Liz and Rishi share their thoughts on our next Prime Minister following tonight's debate. Sakia Starmer joins Ed Pop Stardom. Tomorrow from 6. With sizzling temperatures, it's ITV National Weather. Hello and a very good evening to you. Hope you've all had a lovely Monday so far. Well, the weather picture going forward as we go through the next few days is looking fairly quiet for many, although not good news for the gardens and fields. It looks like we're going to see a few showers around at times, but there will be more in the way of sunshine and thankfully some fresher nights ahead. So for the rest of tonight, we've still got a little system sinking its way south as bringing cloud and a few splashes of very light rain. But for most of us, it is dry overnight with a mix of cloud, clear skies, temperatures there between nine hours. But for most of us, a good deal of dry weather, some bright or sunny spells. It looks like tomorrow the best of that sunshine will be across parts of Wales and southwest England. Sunny spells and showers for Scotland and Northern Ireland and temperatures there feeling rather pleasant. The winds will be lighter. Bye bye. Heinz Beans Burgers, sponsors ITV National Weather. Hello, good evening. You're watching ITV News Meridian. Firefighters are urging people to avoid Hankley Common in Surrey following the huge wildfire there yesterday that was declared a major incident. People are still not able to return to 10 nearby homes and fire crews say they'll need to remain on the common south of Farnham and Aldershot for several days. The fire crews to show you the, the extent of the sheer devastation. Uh, a lot of the common just completely blackened out. A few sole survivors here and there and the danger is in places it's still extremely hot where the vegetation has sort of burnt down and a wind could come up at any second and start the fire once again. The public being urged for the moment to stay well clear. Here is Mike Pierce with a full roundup. The smoke was so intense it could be seen across Surrey and a large part of Hampshire. The blaze which broke out yesterday lunchtime led to 10 homes being evacuated and thousands told to keep their doors and windows closed with a major incident being declared. Jordan Bridge is a pilot based at Lasham in North Hampshire and was flying when he spotted an enormous plume of smoke. It was clear that this smoke was actually emanating from the Hankley Common fire and was extending a long, long way downwind. Uh, so yeah, it was absolutely huge, one of the biggest certainly I've seen in the UK. Astonishment really, um, obviously with the 40 degrees last week, uh, we are obviously now entering a period where these wildfires are going to become more common. Incident Commander Joe lives near Hankley Common and spotted the fire from his bedroom window. I looked out the bedroom window, saw a massive plume of smoke. Uh, I knew it was going to be Hankley. I know the conditions are very dry at the moment, and I knew it was... All those fire officers who came here? So they were faced with a very rapidly spreading fire. We've got the combination of dry vegetation, unfortunately a perfect ing ingredient for a wind-driven fire that's going to spread very rapidly. Well, this is one of many roads in the area closed because of the incident. At its height, there were more than 50 firefighters from right across Surrey and Hampshire with 19 appliances. And they say they could still be here for another two days. 
In the nearest village, locals say they've never seen smoke like it. We got worse and worse and worse, and the smell, and my husband said, I think it's a fire. And it was really sort of really bad, you know, coughing and all that sort of thing, yeah, because it's, you know. The overall effect was the smoke just came over and over, flooded over us, and we had to go indoors and close all the windows. Thick, and when it went over the sun, it was awful. <laughs> <laughs> Don't have barbecues in the woods, take a picnic, take all your rubbish and your litter home with you because it can just be something like a bottle or a discarded cigarette, something as tiny that, as that that starts a fire as big as this. And tonight, while the major incident has been stood down, fire crews remain at the scene. Mike Pierce, ITV News, Hankley Common. Well, we haven't spoken about the local wildlife, which was thriving in this area. There's been a lot of damage, obviously, and we can speak now to Rob Free from Amphibian and Reptile Conservation, a conservation trust. What's the damage been? Uh, well, we think there's about 50 hectares destroyed on this common. Um, it's a really important site for rare reptiles, which is why we're involved as sand lizard and smooth snake on site, both real rarities in the UK and it's taken out some nice habitat that they once inhabited. And, and killed many of them, presumably, sadly. Sadly, yes. Well, it's been a really intense burn, so the ground's got very hot. If they were sheltering underneath, they, uh, a lot of them wouldn't make it. Although we will check later on just to make sure. I was going to say, is there anything you can do? Uh, well, yeah, when we're allowed on, when it's safe, we'll come in and, uh, and do a walk over. Any animals that are emerging, we'll remove them to safety to unburnt habitat. That's a very good point, Rob, because obviously, although we're allowed on here, the public are being told to keep well away for now. Not, sadly, the first wildfire of its kind. No, this is the third one on here in uh, two weeks, and there's been some pretty dev devastating ones. Uh, Purbright Ranges a while ago was, uh, was it 650 hectares, and then there was Ash Ranges in the spring, 300 hectares must be quite upsetting, it must feel like sort of two steps forward and one back sometimes. It does, yeah. I remember on Ash Ranges releasing some sand lizards there in 2010 and I'll, I'll be long retired before the habitat is good enough for them to go back. That's Rob. the time scale you're on. Thank you very much for joining us and explaining that to us. As for uh, what caused this fire, well, I spoke to fire crews earlier. They said it was over such a wide area they may never know where it started or how it started. Derek Johnson reporting there. Well, meanwhile, firefighters have been tackling a fire on a clifftop in Bournemouth this evening. It started at around 7 o'clock in bushes above Boscombe Pier. Six fire engines were sent to the scene. At its height, 24 firefighters battled the flames. And a gorse fire in the New Forest has damaged an area of Heathland the size of three football pitches. Crews from 10 stations across Hampshire were called to the fire at Pennington Common near Lymington yesterday afternoon. Hampshire Fire and Rescue says crews managed to keep the fire contained to the gorse and woodland and stopped it from spreading. In other news, five men have been arrested on suspicion of murder following the death of a teenager in Southampton. Police were called to Langhorn Road in Swadling shortly before 12.30 yesterday lunchtime, following reports that a 19-year-old man had been seriously assaulted. He was taken to hospital with a puncture wound to the chest, where he was pronounced dead. Two men from Bursledon, a man from Hamble, a man from Eastley and a man from London have been arrested and remain in custody. A group of teenagers from Sussex are fronting a new RNLI campaign to prevent drownings in the sea. The group phoned 999 and came to the aid of a couple who got into trouble while swimming last September. Charlotte Wilkins reports. Okay, can I rescue? Uh, there's a couple, they're quite old. Yeah. Um, I sent just seen them they've asked for help. Are they actually in the water? It was a warm September day last year when, as a group of friends were sunbathing, they noticed a couple in the water who were in trouble. And we had noticed them quite early on, but um, it wasn't until a bit later where we realised that they were actually struggling. The friends stayed calm. Millie ran to get help. She called 999 and asked for the Coast Guard. I think I was kind of like in the zone. There was a lot of like adrenaline rushing through me and I was like, these people need some help, we've got to save them kind of thing. The teenagers then found a life ring and threw it out to the couple in distress. We didn't want to take them up off the rocks, we just wanted to make sure they're safe so then the lifeboat could 
um, come and get them out safely. So we waited and made sure we got like towels and stuff to keep them warm. The Friends are now fronting a new campaign called Respect the Water. One of the key messages is if you see someone in trouble, don't jump in to help. The instinct to jump in and help can be overwhelming. Fight your instincts. Make the right call. Call 999. Just hang on there, stay calm. What they did was absolutely fantastic. It was perfect. They put their safety first, and that's so important. So they went out, they, they reached out to them, they shouted to the swimmers, they called 999, asked for the Coast Guard, and that's everything we're asking everyone to do. So it's incredible, really inspiring. Last year, 277 people drowned accidentally in the UK, and half of those were during the summer. Too often, a major factor. How did you feel about the fact that ultimately you saved that?